Galatians 5, 22 and 23. If you're there, say there. Y'all yeah. with me this morning? Yeah. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. You can be seated. Have y'all enjoyed this series so far? Yes. Right, right. If, if you've missed it, it's, they're all online on our YouTube page. You can go back. We've dealt with all of the fruit. This is our final uh, uh, number nine. And we're dealing with what? Self-control. Somebody shout self-control. How many of you need some self-control? Look at your neighbor and just kind of judge them, right? You're not really supposed to judge, but just look at them. And just, do, 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 does your neighbor look like they need some self-control? Look at him. Girl, girl you, you, you need some self-control. I can tell right there, right now. Bro, bro, you need some. Okay? We just look like that. But definitely, I believe that self-control is one of those fruit that we all need. Okay? Before we get into self-control, I want to give you our uh, two major points that we've always wanted to make sure that we take away from this series. And one is that we do not have the power to live by these fruits on our own, okay? We don't have the power. I'll give you the, the official line. We don't produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit. We just allow the fruit to be produced by the Holy Spirit, okay? In and of ourselves, it's going to be hard to love people that don't like us, right? Or maybe that's just me, okay? If you don't like me, it's going to be hard, right? But I can do it with God inside of me, okay? It's going to be hard for, for, for me to love people that I know that hate me. That want to see me fail and want to see me uh, not succeed. Don't want to see my marriage work. Don't want to see my kids healthy and grow up happy, okay? It's going to be hard to love those type of people. But Marvin, guess what? We can do it through Christ. God never told us to produce these fruits on our own. That's why they are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And that's why he gave us the Holy Spirit as a gift. Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will not leave you alone. When I leave, what's going to happen? Three Bible readings. I'm going to send the comforter back to you, right? So when he left, he ascended. What happened? He sent the Holy Spirit to live down inside of the believer. So it's not up to me to make sure that I can love other people. I just got to let the Holy Spirit feel through me. Love, joy. It's hard to have joy. Guess what? When your life is a complete mess. Yeah. Listen, when your, when your bank account is a hot mess, when your marriage is a hot mess, when your job situation is a hot mess, guess what? It's hard to have joy and peace. I can't do that on my own, but through the Holy Spirit, me allowing the Holy Spirit, I can look at my bank account and say, you know what? God is going to take, take, take care of this. Then what can I do? Then I can have peace. Joy is not being happy about everything you're going through. Peace doesn't mean that I don't care about what I'm going through, but it means that I believe and I trust Diana that all things will work together for the good of those who love God. How can I believe that? How can I sleep when everything around me is falling down? It's because the Holy Spirit can give us joy. It can give us peace. The ability to be patient and wait, we don't like that. But it's the Holy Spirit that can produce these fruit on the inside of us. What's the point of having all of these fruit? God wants us to look like him on earth. Okay? That's the point. God wants us to be a reflection of him. Some people will never go to church. But guess what? They can see the God in you. Okay, well, the old song, it's the God in me. Is that what it was? Very, very. Huh? Very, all right. Go ahead on, y'all. Make sure she get two roses at the end of the service, all right? <laughs> okay, that's what that was all about. It's the God in me. God wants us to be a reflection. He wants people to see us and then see him. Okay? When they see us loving people that don't like us, when they see us having joy in chaotic situations, when they see us having peace, when we're suffering and we're grieving, what they see, how, how do you endure that? How do you deal with that? It's the God in me. And then what do they say? You know what? I need what you have. Yeah. Okay? That's how a lot of people can be one of Christ because they see the God on the inside of us. So selfishness is the, the, the self-control is the ninth fruit that we want to deal with. And America and self-control can't even go together on the same paragraph, let alone the same sentence. <laughs> Self-control is not a characteristic of American culture, right? American culture says, do whatever you want to do. How often you want to do it, how long you want to do it, there's only, only one condition, and that is that it feels good to you. <laughs> That's what it's all about. American culture says, do whatever feels good to you, but that is completely contrary to what God has for the believer. It's 
completely contrary to what God requires and what he desires in the life of a believer. God wants us to have self-control. And self-control is the complete opposite of doing whatever you want to do, when you want to do it, how you want to do it, where you want to do it, as long as you want to do it, as long as it feels good to you. So that's what we want to deal with today, the self-control, okay? Let me give you the definition of this Greek word here in Galatians 5 and 23. It literally means self-mastery, self-restraint, listen, and continence. Self-mastery, this is the literal uh, meaning of this word self-control in this verse, self-mastery, self-restraint, and continence. I like the word continence for this because uh, I'm a, I like, I'm a visual person, so I like to see it. Continence literally means uh, uh, bowel control, okay? Bowel control. How many of you can remember those few times, uh, mother, when you've been in the car, you like two exits away from home, <laughs> right? Only like five people that ever had to. And you got to use the bathroom so bad, you're two exits away from home. Why in the world did you not use the bathroom in the car, right? Because you have bowel control, right? You had this urge, right? You felt like you was about to die. Like, oh my God, how many of you have ever started praying? Like, when you're two exits away from home, right? Only a few of us, listen. I done prayed like Jesus. I love you so much. <laughs> That's, that's, that's 
what self-control is. Self-control is less about controlling me and more about allowing God to control us. So we're going to use the same format that we've used over the past few weeks. That's the basics, the barriers, and the blessings. So we're going to look at the basics of self-control, the barriers of self-control, and the blessings of self-control. Okay? Y'all with me today? Yeah. All right. Uh, one of the first things I want us to know about the basics is that self-control is a requisite of a disciple of Jesus Christ. I'm going to give you a lot of verses today because this has been like Bible study. And I want you to go home and take these verses. You don't have to turn to all of them, but we'll put many of them on the wall just so you can write down. Self-control is a requisite for a disciple of Jesus Christ. In Luke 9 and 23, Jesus is teaching about discipleship. And he says, and he said to all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and do what? Take up his cross daily and follow me. When Christ said deny himself, he was referencing self-control. Take up your cross daily. Taking up your cross daily means that you're going to have to say no to self every day and yes to God every day. Self-control is not something that you're just going to be able to pray for. So at the end of the service, we're going to pray for it, but guess what? You're going to have to pray for it again tomorrow. Because guess what happens, mamas, when your child goes crazy tomorrow evening? Your children are going to be so beautiful today, right? they pretty, they got their new dress on, they're going to be all night, they're about to a car that they wrote with a crayon, they spell wrong and words, letters all backwards and stuff. You're like, oh, that's so cute. And then guess what? That tomorrow, Damien is coming back, okay? <laughs> tomorrow, baby's kids is going to be back, right? And your self-control is going to be tested. And you're going to be like, well, hold up, I just prayed for self-control yesterday, God, and now I just, I, I failed. I just cussed my kid out after we just went to church. Not all of you, right? Like, the Christians don't cuss, right? Okay, they do? <laughs> Depending on what the number you're Baptist, I can't remember. <laughs> you're not Baptist, okay, anyway. <laughs> so you know, your self-control is going to be tested. Okay? But it's a requisite, it's a re requisite that every day, it's a daily thing that we're going to have to pray for self-control. We're going to have to fight for self-control. We're going to have to allow self-control to rise up inside of us. Not just going to the altar one time. God, give me self-control, and that's it. No, it's going to be a daily thing that you're going to have to seek for. And God requires it of a disciple, right? As a disciple of Jesus Christ, you are going to have to be able to tell yourself no. Look down at yourself and say no. No, what your nasty self. Okay, you won't say that part. Of it, all right. <laughs> so self-control is a requisite for a disciple. It's expected, right? Another thing that we need to know about the basics: there's a war within, and self-control determines if we win. Right? All of us who are in the flesh are believers. There's a battle waging on the inside of us. There's a war waging on the inside of us, and some of you had it this morning. <laughs> How many of you fought yourself to even get out of the bed and come here this morning? Okay, you don't have to raise your hand. Only one, two people raised their hand to rip them. So, I mean, we got a lot of liars in church this morning. Okay? <laughs> KJ, stop lying. You know you fought with to get here this morning, okay? <laughs> There's a war that's waging inside of us. Let me give you some, some scriptures on this. Romans 7, 21 and 23. It reads, this is Paul writing to the church in Rome. He says, so I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, Evil is right there with me. Anybody ever feel like that? Like almost every day, right? <laughs> like there's an opportunity to do something that you know God is not pleased with. But guess what? There's something on the inside at the same time that says, I don't want to do wrong. I want to do right. Right? If loving you is wrong, I don't know. You know, I want to do right. My mind is telling me one thing, but my body, yeah, you want to do right. Okay? But then there's something else on the inside. There's a war. Somebody said there's a war. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. He's like, if evil is there, I want to please my flesh. I want to do whatever I want to do. But then at the same time, I want to praise God. I want to worship God. I want to love him and represent him and reflect him. I want love to flow out of me. But at the same time, I want to cuss my coworker out. I want to have joy. But at the same time, I want to go off on a person who cut me off on the road. I want to have peace. You know, it's a war. But I see another law at work in me, waging war. There's a battle inside of all of us. Waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. There's a battle going on inside of me. One pulling me on the, on the left side and another is pulling me on the right side. Guess what? I hate 
hate to tell you, but that's your life. <laughs> that's your life. If you, can, if you became a believer thinking that you would never have a desire to do anything God is not uh, pleased with ever again in your life, I'm sorry. I hate to be the one to bust your bubble, and I apologize on behalf of any preacher who told you that or even insinuated that becoming a believer and getting filled with the Holy Spirit it does not mean that you'll never have a, another desire. There's going to always be that battle on the inside of you. Yeah. How will you win the battle? With self-control. With the ability to say what? No, no to me. I'm going to ask you that so y'all see if y'all can pass the class today, okay? With the ability to what? No to me. For the sake of saying Yes to God, clap, you passed your Sunday star test, okay? That's what this is. He said, if you're going to have victory, what are you going to have to do? You're going to have to have self-control. Okay, can we deal with this war? Because there's at least three areas of war that I want to make sure that we know that we're going to have to fight in with self-control of that weapon, all right? One is the war of the flesh. The war of the flesh. We read you the scripture, Galatians 5, 19 through 21 says, Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will inherit the kingdom of God. Listen, Paul told Timothy in the book, in 2 Timothy, that one of the signs of the last days is that people will have no self-control. Yeah. He said, that's how you know you're in the last days, when you can look around and everybody wants to do anything and everything that pleases them. It's the works of the flesh. Somebody say, I gotta fight the works of the flesh. There's a war. That's where lust comes from. Sexual sin. I, I, I was looking at different works of the flesh in the scripture, and, and one jumped out at me that really convicted me that we really talk about in church because we, we always talk about sexual sin, right? We always talk about adultery. We always talk about fornication. We always talk about homosexuality. We always talk about lying and cheating and backbiting. But one, one of the works of the flesh that, that, that contradicts self-control that we really talk about is gluttony. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but guess what? It's in the same paragraph with all these other sins. Right? So at that point, I'm like, I'm getting convicted at that point because when I started thinking about when I went to that soul food restaurant and I started thinking about what I ate, like that was straight gluttony, Robin. Like that was straight gluttony. Many of us don't, many of us in our culture, us, struggle with gluttony. Many, how many of you are not going to the restaurant but you're going to a family gathering today? Really? Just a few people? Okay. Most of y'all, a lot of y'all just didn't want to raise y'all hand, right? A lot, of, a lot of us who go into these family gatherings, you're going to see them with gluttony on today. Some of y'all, I'm going to feel convicted. <laughs> and when you go to a restaurant, I was thinking like, hmm, if you go to a restaurant, how many of you go to a restaurant to get an appetizer before your meal? Raise your hand, raise your hand. So you got the appetizer, then you got the meal, and then how many of you ever had, and then you got the dessert after that? <laughs> Okay, guess what? That's gluttony. That's gluttony. By the time you got to the dessert, you were full. You had the gypsy dip and then ate a three course meal. It was a meat and two sides. You was halfway full before you even got past the half the chicken fried steak. We, why do we keep going? Why do we keep going? Self control. And God said, because we lack self-control, we suffer disease. Yes. Yes. Disease. But gluttony is one of the areas. That's why in our culture we lead in what? Diabetes. Heart issues. High blood pressure. Diabetes. Cholesterol. Where, where does all this stuff come from? From the food. Now, now, don't get it. There's always a small percentage of people who 
get those things just because of hereditary issues, but that's that's not 75%. 75% of the people with high blood pressure cholesterol didn't get that from a hereditary standpoint. Uh, most of us got that from the choices that we made with food. And, and it's gluttony. Why am I dealing with that? Because that's, that, that's one thing that, that Christians, we feel like if we can just get, I'm good on self-control because I don't have, because I don't cheat on my spouse. I'm good on self-control because I'm a single and I don't have sex. I'm good on self-control because I can drink and I don't get drunk. You know, but the gluttony part, what about that part? God says, that's sin. And if you can't control your appetite, then guess what? You struggle just as much as the person next to you who's struggling with alcohol. Amen. No, there's no way. <laughs> there's no way when it might have put it in there. Uh -huh. So you telling me the Bible says that he sees the person who cannot control his sexual appetite the same way he sees the person who cannot control his food appetite? Yes. Yes. Did I make this up, y'all? <laughs> it's Mother's Day, Pastor. Why are you talking about sin? Right. Right? Because we need to teach our son, we need to teach our children what self-control is, and we can't teach them what we can't show them. Right. You got a Mother's Day lesson right there. Let's live to be the example in front of our children. Okay? So, so that's, that's the war of the flesh. That's just a few things, but you gotta think about it. You gotta ask God, God, what's warring in my flesh that I'm allowing, uh, uh, that I'm not taking control of? Okay? Uh, the war of the flesh. The second one is the war of the mind. I love George Rogers calls it the battlefield of the mind. I love that. Anybody wage a war in the mind, whether you raise your hand or not, you are. Everything that, that, that was in that Galatians uh, 5, those, 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 the war of the flesh, guess where it starts? <laughs> it starts up here. Everybody who ever allowed his sexual appetite to lose, to lose control, or her sexual appetite to lose control, it started here. Uh, when we when we gluttoned, guess what? You was thinking you was thinking about that before we even got there. It's like, oh my God, those robes are about to be fired up, Lord. <laughs> right? You were thinking about that all the way there. <laughs> mind control. I got mind control over Debo. <laughs> you tell me to shut up, I stop talking. But then when you leave, I'll be talking again. <laughs> it starts in the mind. The war. The battlefield of the mind. Uh, and, and here's the thing. A lot of us, we get self-righteous and, and holy because uh, we've conquered a lot of things in the flesh, right? We've conquered a, a lot of things in the flesh. Like I said, we don't do these big five sins that everybody talks about. And you may be good in the eyesight of men, but guess what? God knows your thoughts. <laughs> Just because you, 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 you hide the lust in your thoughts and you don't allow it to flow out. God is like, no, it's just God said, you already see it. He said, you already see it when you saw yourself in the act. He said, you already see it. So it's like, okay, yeah, maybe man cannot, can, can't condemn you because they didn't see you in the physical act. Maybe you can't be talked about on Facebook because you weren't the one who got caught in the physical act. But God is like, but I see your thoughts. He was like, I know what's in your heart. I know what you want to do. I know what you dream about. I know what overtakes you in your thought. He said, I know those things. So even though you may look holy in the eyesight of the people around you, he's like, I know your thoughts are filthy, nasty, and dirty. And if we go back to discipleships, shifting from being a believer to a disciple, the disciple doesn't just care about people seeing him as holy, but they want God to see him as holy, separated and righteous. So that, that, that's the war, the war of the mind. Controlling your thoughts is not limited to what you refuse to think on, but what you choose to think on as well. So it's not just trying to remove dirty thoughts and evil thoughts and I want to kill my boss and strangle him and you, you done had visions and dreams of how you're going to do it and tie him up and blow his left arm off and cut his left foot off and all that stuff. That's murder, right? You know that, right? Okay, that's murder. Uh, but it's not just about rebuking and moving those thoughts. But he says, what are you going to replace them with? So, so, so self-control of the mind, the thoughts, it's not just uh, 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 figuring out what not to think on, but also making a choice on what to think on. So what do I, what, what do, I do in that? 
Paul tells the Philippian church in Philippians 4 and 8, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, he says what? He says, think on these things, okay? So are you trying to fight the evil thoughts that Satan is planning in our head? What do I do? What do I think on? You think on something that's honorable. Think on something that's just. Think on something that's pure, that's lovely, com commendable, excellent. Anything you can praise about. He said, this is what I want you to think about. This is the ability to control the thoughts on the inside of you. To put away lustful thoughts and think about scripture. To put away evil thoughts and think about praising God and worshiping God and honoring God. That's what self-control is. Yeah. The ability to what? Say no to me. For the sake of saying yes to God. Okay, y'all got an 80 on that. Let's see if we can bring that grade up. So we got the war of the what? The mind. War of the mind, what was the first one? Flesh. War of the flesh. And this last one is war of the emotions. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, we got a lot of issues right here. <laughs> war of the emotions. Y'all want to find another Mother's Day nugget in this one, or y'all want me to move on? <laughs> Proverbs 16 and 32 says, Whoever is slow to anger is better than the mighty. And he who rules his spirit, he who rules his emotions, the mind, will, and emotions, then he who takes a city. Some emotions, anger, fear, grief. Guess what? All of our emotions that we have, God gave them to us. The problem is, when they're not controlled, then they become unhealthy. God never said, don't ever be angry. He says, well, be angry and don't, and don't sin. In that Galatians 5 that we read, we read with the, with the, uh, about the, the, the works of the flesh, it says outbursts of anger. Okay, I think the English Standard Version just says anger, but I think the NLT New Living Translation says, says outbursts of anger. How many of you struggle with that? Outbursts of anger. How many mamas struggle with It's Mother's Day. We'll, do it. we'll get on the Father's Day, but right now it's Mother's Day. Huh? How many of your parents, how many of your mama struggles with outbursts of anger? How many of you grew up like that? Okay, guess what that was? It's the inability to control one's emotions. And guess what? Today, we have unhealthy adults because we had parents who didn't have self-control in the area of anger. Yeah. Woo! Grown people abusing other people physically, abuse because of the of, because mama and daddy didn't have self-control with anger. Fear. God gave us fear. Fear is good. It's just what is what is it, how is it impacting you? Okay, brother, if I go out the front door and I see a lion at the mailbox, <laughs> God gave me that fear to use as wisdom. <laughs> fear says you better get back in the house. <laughs> right? So God is not just pleased with you using fear in a situation that it calls for, but when fear causes you to not be able to walk in your purpose, when fear causes you to not be able to trust God and move forward, then guess what? You have the end, you, 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 not you self-control. Your fear has moved beyond what God has given it to you for. Amen. Grief. It's a feeling that God gave us. The Bible talks about we can grieve. We lose loved ones. Guess what? We can grieve. When does it move to the realm of not having self-control? When my grief causes me to get on drugs? Yeah. When my grief causes me to go use other coping mechanisms? Alcohol, weed, men, women. Uh, when, when it causes me to seek those other coping mechanisms, then guess what? Grief has moved beyond a realm of control. Yeah. And, and guess what? what? What you don't control, you serve. Amen. Well, what you don't control, you become a slave of. So if you can't control your anger, then guess what? You're a slave of anger, and whatever you're a slave of, you do whatever they say, do when they say do it. <laughs> That's why it can come, it can hit when you have no control of your anger. You do what he tells you to do. And then why do we feel so bad after? Right? That's something I got to struggle with. All right, God, help me control my anger. 
I'm a lot better than I was 10, 15 years ago. My sister can tell you I was bad, I had anger issues. <laughs> right? But it, it again, self-control is not about 100% completely removing the issue. I still get hot as fire, hot as fish grease. <laughs> but the ability to not act on it as much is self-control. Right? I don't think that you can ever completely not want to kill your kid at some point in your life, right? Always. How many of you have grown children that you want to kill every now and then? Okay? <laughs> they raised their hand and the kid sitting right next to them, but the, problem, the thing is the kid knows it. <laughs> right? So even when they're grown, that, that, that feeling, that, that desire, that anger that will rise up forever, as, as long as you're a parent, the fact that you don't do it is because you have self-control. So it's not about trying to remove the feeling all the time. It's about the ability to control it. Okay, somebody shout, I need self-control. I need self-control. Okay, now let's look at the barriers of self-control. Three barriers of self-control. So now it really gets to the self-examination part because we've all acknowledged that we got self-control issues in some area, whether it be in the flesh, whether it be in your mind, uh, uh, or whether it be in your thoughts. But what are some reasons, and these are only three, right? This is not exhaustive. You can find your other reasoning. We gotta say, God, show me why I have an issue with self-control in this area. But one of them is laziness. Yeah. A lot of us, we have self-control issues just because we're lazy. We're lazy believers. I'm talking to Christians right now, okay? We're lazy believers. And guess what? The reason why we're lazy is because it takes more work to fight than it does to surrender. Wow. Right? It takes more work to fight. If we were going into a battle, okay? Okay, if we were going into a battle with some other country or whatever, if we want to fight, we're going to have to put a lot of work in. We're going to have to put some gear on, we're going to have to go out into the field, we're going to get dirty, stinky, we might even catch a couple of flesh wounds, we might even get shot, we might even lose some people, but guess what's easier than doing that? Just say, okay, we lose, <laughs> we surrender, we don't even want to fight, we don't want to sweat, we don't want to have no casualties, just come in here and have your way. And that's why some of us lack self-control, because we're just lazy. It requires an effort to fight the enemy. <laughs> It requires an effort. And sometimes you fall, but you got to get back up again. And some of us, we've fallen so many times that we've gotten tired of getting back up. It's easier to just stay down and say, Satan, you ain't, if I just stay down, Satan ain't got to keep me down. If I just stay down, Satan ain't got to shoot at me. He ain't got to try to come stab me in the back. He ain't got to come try to cut me down. I'll just stay down and he'll leave me alone. Wow. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes non-believers have an easier life than believers. Yeah. <laughs> Simple. I don't mean like from a financial standpoint, if you're a non-believer, you'll have more money, but sometimes just stress level, peace level, because the enemy's not trying to fight them as much. The devil don't need to go try to, to, to kill nobody who, who's on his team. <laughs> Right? So sometimes we get lazy and it takes an effort to have self-control. What do you have to do? Sometimes you gotta go, not sometimes, all the time. You need to go learn what the Bible says about your issue. Yeah. How many of you who struggle with anger can quote me five verses on anger right now? Raise your hand. Look around the room. Are y'all willing to be honest for my survey real quick? <laughs> Raise your hand if you struggle with anger. Now look around the room. Everybody look around. Keep your hands up. Look around the room. This is just for survey sake. Okay, now put your hand down. Now again, raise your hand if you know five, if you can quote five scriptures on anger right now. You see the difference? Okay. What what happens when I have those scriptures on anger? Is that when, when it rages up and I wanna and you wanna lash out, then the Holy Spirit can bring that scripture back to your remembrance. And it's that scripture. If you go back to Jesus in the wilderness, how did he have victory over the temptations of Satan? It was with the word of God. What if Jesus didn't know the word of God that dealt with those specific temptations? He would have been defeated. The reason why so many of us are defeated in the areas of self-control is because we do not know what God's word says about that area. What does God, you struggle with self-control and sexual, in your sexual desires? Do you know the scriptures? Because when you're driving over there, 
<laughs> at 11 o'clock at night on a Friday night talking about I'm just going to watch a movie? Nah. <laughs> you ain't got no script. God ain't got nothing to speak to you about. <laughs> Only thing God can say is stop, because that's all he, that's all you got on the inside of you. You're like, stop, stop. God is like, please stop, stop, stop. <laughs> but if you had the scriptures, then you could be quoted. The scriptures to you about sexual sin, about, about purity. What's the point? What's the challenge? Whatever your struggle area is with self-control, go find out what God says about it. Meditate on those. I'm trying to show you how to have victory, okay? It does not matter that if we finish this service, if I called you down, laid hands on you, and put got oil and put a cross over your forehead, if you don't know what the word God says about your issue and where you lack self-control, God cannot bring that back to your mind. The word of God is sharper than the two-edged sword, not you. Okay? So, so laziness. Another barrier of self-control is selfishness. I think this is probably where most of us are. Selfishness. What, what, what selfishness? I just want to please me. I just want to please me. Okay. Follow my flesh instead of following God. There's a poss strong possibility that that reason is because I'm selfish. Wow, this makes me feel good. Man, I love this. I get joy out of this, so I think. I get peace out of this, so I think it makes me. Ooh, it makes me feel complete and whole. And God is like, no, this is selfishness. Okay, so laziness, selfishness. Last one, misplacement of God. Misplacement of God. What does that mean? God is not where he's supposed to be. And where is that? First. <laughs> he's not number one. On a priority level in your life, God is supposed to be number one. Okay? Not you. Because we've taken him from number one, we don't make decisions based on him being number one. We make decisions based on me being number one. So I don't make decisions that say, God, I'm making this decision. I'm making the best decision that causes you to be pleased with me. So what does that mean? When I do that, when I lack self-control because he's not in the right position, it's because he's been misplaced. All right? I'm almost out of here. Let's look at the blessings of self-control. Three of them real quick. One is a protected life. These are the blessings. If you walk and follow self-control and allow God to give you the strength to say no to me and what? Yes. And yes to him. There's some blessings that come along with it. One is a protected life. A covered life. Give me some scripture. Proverbs 25 and 8. A man without self-control, a woman without self-control is like a city broken into and left without wall. If you had no walls in the biblical days, guess what? Anybody could come in and destroy you. Nehemiah, he heard that Israel, the walls had been torn down, and his first response was to cry. Why? Because he knew Israel was in a state where they could be destroyed by anybody else. If you don't have any walls up, then you're not protected. And the Bible says that self-control is a protective method for you. The second thing that, that's a blessing of self-control, not only uh, uh, a protected life, but a victorious life, right? Because if you're steady saying no to me, which is connected to Satan and him temptation, guess what? You're walking in victory. The reason why so many of us are defeated is just because we won't say no. Somebody shout, just say no yes. to whatever your drug is. Whatever your drug is, whatever makes you feel high, whatever makes you feel deep, but it doesn't. Please God. You're walking in defeat if not. But if you have self-control, you have a victorious life. The last one is a rewarded life. How many of you want some rewards? 1 Corinthians 9 and 25 says, Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. What does that mean? 
that when you're running, they discipline their body, they have self-control, they prepare, they practice so that they can get some type of crown, some gold, medal, silver, medal, bronze, medal. But he says, we do it because God has a reward for us that won't fade away. So it's not a reward that we'll get here on this earth, but it's an eternal. God says, I have rewards for my children, my son, my daughter, who's willing to say what? No, no, no. no to self and what? Yes, yes, and yes to God. That's what God is challenging us on this morning, is to have self-control. Put me back in my proper place, number one. Yes. When the decisions that you make are based on pleasing me and not pleasing yourself. This whole series, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faithfulness, meekness, uh, temperance. He says, all I want you to do is reflect me. That, that's what this is all about. He says, just reflect me. Let people see the God in you. And you'll live a fruitful life. Give God a praise.